Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Joe Gordon. I work for HP. And today we're going to talk about very large development, how to run code review for 1,000 open source developers. So about me, I'm a full-time developer on OpenStack at HP. Um, that means I work almost entirely upstream. I do almost nothing. I don't know anything about HP, so don't ask me any questions about that. I work on OpenStack mainly. Um, I'm available on IRC and et cetera. So this is taken straight from Olo, and I think they're here. So if anybody's in the room from Olo, great job, guys. Um, so what is very large development? I'm using the definition from Olo. Um, in the past 12 months, OpenStack has had 1,241 developers, making this one of the top 2% of all projects on Olo, and 1,600 developers in this lifetime. So this is a massive project, all open source, all Python, which is not really the language you'd expect to have a massive open source project in. Um, it's not compiled. It's a nice language, but it's not compiled, and that leads to some problems. So what is OpenStack? It's a lot, a lot of Python. Um, these numbers were taken yesterday. Then it's 1.4 million, li million lines of Python. Of that, there's about just under a million lines of actual code. We have a bunch of other languages here, XML, JavaScript, um, and some other ones. Uh, we have a few other pieces of code in there, and, but mostly, it's mostly Python at the end. So this actually turns out that I think it's the biggest open source Python project that I know of. If anybody knows of a bigger one, I'd be happy to update this. Um, I did this talk a while back, and PyPy was bigger at the time, and now we've beat PyPy. Uh, PyPy is a Python, or Python uh, the Python language written in Python. So it's, that's why it's the snake eating itself, and now we're bigger than PyPy, um, at just under a million lines of code. So we're huge. Um, we're in uncharted territory for Python itself. We're this massive project doing these massive things on a massive scale. So what is OpenStack? It's um, a cloud operating system is to take the, the, uh, the marketing phrasing here. Um, it's a bunch of APIs that use, uh, consume different resources, uh, compute, storage, networking. But we're not really talking about OpenStack today. We're talking about how we develop it. So it turns out that under that nice little picture, it's complicated. And under that simple picture, it actually is even more complicated. So we have a lot of moving parts here. Um, tons of services. This is actually very outdated at this point. There are many pieces missing, as Florian is looking, trying to find all the missing pieces. Um, so this is actually a very simplified picture itself. So we have this big, complex piece of software they're working on. So who is OpenStack? A lot of big companies are working on it, HP among them, um, AT&T, IBM, Ubuntu, Rackspace, Red Hat, Suze, a whole bunch of others. Um, a bunch of smaller companies are using it as well, some other big ones, Cisco. Um, and those are all the contributors, and there's actually even more users of it. So these are all, this is a small set of the users, and there are many, many more out there now. This is also an old slide. Um, I don't know the full list of all users now, but it's hundreds and hundreds. You hear more of them every day. Um, I think the biggest deployment to date is 16,000 nodes in a single data center, and I think that's probably closer to 18,000 now, and that's Bluehost. So we're looking for the data center scale. So that's what we're designing the software for, this big, massive piece of software with all these big moving components. We're trying to run a data center. This is actually Rackspace's data center. The, the caption's cut off. Um, you can see that actually it's pretty empty in this picture, but this is an actual OpenStack data center for Rackspace. So we have this big project we're trying to do, and we're doing it on this massive deployment scale. But it turns out it's also a massive development scale. So this is big project, million lines of code, working for the data center, and we have over 1,000 developers working on it. So these are the latest numbers. Um, the past 30 days, we've had just under 4,000 commits. The past 12 months, we've had just under 40,000 commits. Past one month, we've had 340 contributors and 1,200 in the past year. So this is a big project. A lot of contributors were bigger than most other projects out there. Um, so by biggest uh, Python project, I mean, we're biggest in number of lines, number of contributors, um, any other metric you can think of, I think we're bigger in now. And if there's another metric you guys could think of that something that's a bigger project, I'd be happy to know about that one. Um, over its lifetime, which is just over three years now, there's been 90,000 commits from 1,600 contributors for 1.7 million lines of code overall. So this is huge. Um, we have exponential growth, which is hard to handle when you're trying to run code review and run a development process. We have more contributors every day. Um, and it keeps going up. In January 2011, we had 61 contributors and 71,000 lines of code, which is a nice size project by every definition of project. And now we're way past that, and we've gone way beyond that with millions of lines of code and 
thousands of developers. So it's been hard for us to actually sustain this exponential growth in the development process, and we're still struggling with that. But we've made it this far, and we hope to make it much further. So Python's a great language. I don't know if you guys ever use it here. Hopefully, some of you have. Um, OK, at least one person has. That's a good sign. So it's a fun language. We like it a lot. Um, it's a fast language to develop. It's fun. If you ever use something like C and you go to Python, it's, there's no semicolons, no curly braces. It's a nice language to look at. Um, it's very approachable. It sort of makes sense when you look at it for the most part. But there's some cons when you're doing this big, massive project. We don't have type checking in Python. We don't have any of this static time analysis that's really great for these big projects. Um, there's no header files. If somebody changes a function definition somewhere, we may not catch it at static time analysis. So we have to have work around those problems. Um, turns out concurrency isn't that great in Python yet. Um, and so we have, this is a big concurrent project, so we have some problems there. Um, but overall, we've, we've overcome most of them. Um, and we don't have any other kinds of static analysis. You make, you know, you run GCC or you run make or something and another, another compiler engine. You have all these errors you get at, all these warning errors. And we don't really have that, that chance to do that. So we have to work around that and do what we can. And that kind of thing is, these problems are, are not a problem when you have five developers, 10 developers, you know, 50,000 lines of code. You can sort of manage around some of these static time analysis problems. When you have a million lines of code and no one person knows what the whole project does or knows the whole architecture, this static time analysis becomes really valuable. So development process. So we have had a, we have a fairly strange process to develop this. Um, some people don't like it, and I understand that. Um, it's a bit unusual, and it could be burdensome at first, but we're trying to work on that and make that easy. Um, but most importantly, we've made this actually work on the massive scale that we work on. So this is, just to compare, this is a life of a GitHub patch today. There's many ways of using GitHub and Git. Um, this is a very common one. You fork the repo, you press the little button, you write your code, you test it out locally, push it up to GitHub repo. Um, you submit a pull request. Hopefully, Travis CI runs a test on your patch, if you're using Travis CI or something like it. Um, and that, the Travis CI feature is fairly new, and that's because this actual workflow is new. This, is, this workflow is actually newer than OpenStack, which is one of the big answers to the question of why don't you use GitHub? Um, GitHub is about, uh, OpenStack is about three years old. This is about a year and a half old, this workflow. Um, the patch is reviewed by some people, and eventually it's, you know, you fix any problems that the, the reviewer has, and it gets merged in, and then Travis CI runs on trunk, and trunk may fail. Hopefully you didn't make it fail and everything works, but it may. And if you ever look on GitHub, it fails all the time. Um, so where we started three years ago, roughly, uh, a bit over three years ago now, this was on Launchpad with Bazaar and all that weird stuff on Launchpad. If you guys ever use Launchpad, it's a great tool. We still use it today. Um, we just don't use it for code review. Um, this was how it looked initially, and it wasn't great. It was pretty good. Um, this is 61 developers, roughly, maybe even less at this point. It was sort of easy to manage all this, the very simple, uh, system, this worked very well, but it wasn't enough for us. The first step we did is we moved to Garrett. Garrett's a great tool. It came out of um, Google, I believe, and it's from the um, Android project, and it's a nice code review tool written in Java. Um, and this is what the first and early code review looked like, which is somebody made a change, somebody ran the unit tests and said, you broke the unit tests. That's a really silly review. We don't like to have to manually do these things. Um, this means that if somebody doesn't, didn't run the unit test and they reviewed it anyway, then trunk broke and we don't like breaking trunk. So the first thing we did is we added some gating tests in. So before you actually merge something, we have um, Garrett and Jenkins will actually merge it for you. So at this point, we have no human merging. So there's uh, a set of viewers who are privileged and they have approval power. And approval power means that the tests are run and then Garrett and Jenkins will actually merge the patch. So the first thing we did is added basic unit tests in. We want to make sure we don't break the unit test. It's a pretty simple requirement. Um, we also want to make sure it merges. If it doesn't merge, that happens a lot. Um, actually, nowadays, it doesn't merge a lot because we have the velocity of the project is so, so great that you have to rebase a lot, unfortunately. And we want to have some basic style checks, um, in this case, PEP8. So this is really great as a first step, but it wasn't enough. It turns out we actually want to support Python 2.6. Red Hat still has uh, 2.6 support in uh, RHEL, so we want to support it as well. We also want to have integration tests. This is a big project with a lot of different moving components. Integration tests are uh, essential for this. So unit tests are great, but we really actually want integration tests. So we actually wrote a small development environment for integration testing. We run against that. We have all the same tests as before. Now we have the unit tests running twice in 2.6, 2.7. 
and now we have a bit better code coverage. Um, we still had a problem with this, which is that we're merging code, and we're, we're, we say uh, approval, we try, run it, we try merging the code, running the tests, and if everything works, we merge it. The problem is that still the reviewer has to manu manually still look for these issues. So here's an example. After we had all that, somebody noticed, hey, I think you forgot something. So this is a PEP8 violation. Uh, for some reason, in Python, we don't like tabs. We use spaces. So we just, OK, we do that. Um, and we have to manually, at this point, we had to manually look for that. So the next step is we actually have a, gate, uh, a check test. So you push your patch up, just like on Travis CI today. You push your patch up, um, and we actually run all the tests uh, on that patch before it gets merged. So now we have, you're running the, uh, the test twice. So if you have a perfect patch, you push it up. There's no problems with it. Everybody loves it. It gets reviewed by two core reviewers. The core reviewers are this privileged set of people who've been around, and the community trusts them. I mean, to get appointed into the core team, somebody in core nominates you. Um, you push your patch up, it gets reviewed. Everything looks good. The unit tests run against it. The reviewer knows, hey, he didn't break anything. Now I don't have to care about your syntax. I don't have to care about if you broke the unit test. I just have to look at the new unit test you added and make sure those unit tests look good. Um, I know that you're not going to break anything. We test integration testing, and we can merge it, and then we try again. And every so often, actually, something will look good on the check and will fail on the gate because the project moved and the velocity is so fast now that you have to rebase every so often. Um, and this is actually a fairly old list of the tests, and we've actually grown this much further today. So now we have over 10 tests. We have docs tests. We have docs. We like to make sure they work. Um, so we have a docs test. That actually bu rebuilds the docs every time. Um, and if you actually click on the link, you can actually see the proposed doc change, which is great. So if somebody's working on a doc patch, you want to see if they rendered it properly, you could click on the link and see it being rendered. We have PEP8. PEP8 actually is, needs to be corrected. That's actually full style checking. We have PEP8 plus a whole bunch of other things now. Um, one of the problems we have with things like a big project is that we want all the code to look the same. We have nitpicking. I'm sure you guys have gotten to this before. Somebody likes, you know, camel case. Somebody likes um, Turkish notation. What's the other one? Polish notation. Um, anyway, there's people like different things. You want your code to look the same. It doesn't really matter what the code looks like as long as it's the same. That's the important part. So we have a big set of tests that we make sure all the code looks the same as much as we can. Um, we run the unit tests. We actually have, I don't think it's there yet, but we're actually working on Python 3.3 support. We have PyPy support we're working on as well. Um, in this project, we don't actually have it, but other projects we have, we gate on Python 3.3 as well and PyPy. Um, we have a whole bunch of integration environments. It turns out when people run OpenStack, they don't run it in a single environment. There's many different uh, supported environments. So we try to support at least a few of them upstream and gating. So we run it on MySQL. That's the standard we use today. Um, Postgres, because people like Postgres as well, you want to support that. And every so often, we'll have a case where something works in MySQL and not in Postgres or vice versa. And so this is an important test for us. Can you explain what the uh, platforms are that we actually run the diff stack e checks on? Yeah, I'll get to that. Um, <laughs> let me just get through this first. Um, we have Neutron, so we have two networking uh, supported networking pieces, Neutron and Nova Networking, so you run both of those. So we have um, DevSec Gate, VM Full, VM Postgres are both on Nova Networking. We have a Neutron test. We have a large ops test, which is brand new, and I worked on this uh, a couple of weeks ago. And the idea is here that we actually want to make sure this stuff works at scale. Unfortunately, we can't test this at scale, so we use a fake for a driver. We swap out KVM or QMU and we use a stub driver, which just writes something to a database, and make sure that things don't break on that scale. And it turns out, sometimes things do. It's a big, complicated uh, puzzle. So we want to make sure that it actually works on some sort of scale testing that we could do on small scale. Um, we do this for uh, Neutron and Nova Networking, and we have a grenade test, which is upgrading. And so the different platforms we have is we have these, um, we have a tool called DevStack, which is, so. It's upon an OpenStack, DevStack, OpenStack. DevStack is a development environment, not used for production, but this is what we use for testing. It's a simple environment. It's great for testing, and it's the same environment every time. So this is our standard de facto testing environment. Um, so we have this nice integration environment you could test everything in, and we run integration tests on top of that. Uh, Grenade is an upgrade test. So we want to make sure that the code upgrades. People have uh, legacy deployments now. They want to upgrade it. We want to support that. So we have this test. We deploy an old version and try to make sure we can upgrade to the newer version. And we're slowly trying to expand out all these tests. Um, I think there's several other tests in the works. We have something called Cells, which is for scalability. That's going online very soon. Um, we're trying to expand the upgrade testing. 
Upgrading has been a, a big struggle for us in the past, and we're trying to get better at it. And so the way to do that is you fix it up, you gate on it, and now we can't break it. So all this comes to the life of the patch today, which is similar to the GitHub's uh, model, but it's slightly different. So just like the GitHub model, you clone everything, write the code uh, locally, you test it locally, submit your patch for review. Uh, code is automatically tested on submission, just like it is on GitHub. Code is reviewed. You fix it up for any problems you have. Code is approved, not merged, approved. And then the code is automatically retested and merged if it passes. So if it doesn't pass, it gets approved. It fails the merge or it fails the test. It comes back to you saying, this failed. Take a look at what happened. You look and go, oh, so-and-so who's working on the same piece of code as me got their code in first. Now I have to fix my code to rebase on theirs. You push it up again. You try again. It gets approved again. And then hopefully it merges. So the big difference here is that we actually gate on things. So no human has merge power. Um, and this keeps us all sort of honest and makes it easier for everybody. So where does this leave us today? So we have some basic principles that all this leads up to, which is never break, break trunk. We have 1,000 developers. You break trunk, somebody's going to want to kill you somewhere in the world. Um, we're all over the world now. So there's developers all over the, you know, every um, time zone that has people that I know of. This means that if something breaks in the middle of the night, somebody's going to notice. So you want to make sure trunk never breaks no matter what. Um, turns out it does break. This is very hard to do. Um, some of the big ways it breaks is we have floating dependencies. You want to keep floating dependencies because uh, distributions don't like when you say, I need a three-year-old version of this library that we've been testing against. So we keep our dependencies floating, so sometimes that breaks. I think nowadays we probably break trunk once a month for three hours a month, I would say, which is incredible because of where we started two years ago even. Things would break for a couple days at a time every other day, every other week. So, so we come really far on this. Um, so it's never break trunk as possible, but that, there's always exceptions to that. Um, the big one here is that developers are never blocked on this. We're always working on trunk. So we, we always pull from trunk. We don't have an un, um, unstable branch. Everything's on trunk. And we want to keep trunk green because people want to deploy on trunk, crazy enough. Um, Rackspace is deploying trunk. HP is trying to deploy trunk. And there's some projects I'm working on they're trying to make it easier for other people to deploy trunk. But this means that you're doing continuous deployment and continuous upgrades. And if you guys saw Monty Taylor's talk yesterday, that's what this is about. So we want to keep trunk green and deployable. Um, and we also want to never break, because developers are pulling off trunk. We want to make sure that they pull something that's not broken. Because if you have 1,000 developers trying to work on something and it's broken, you get a lot of angry letters. Um, transparency, we try to keep everything out of the open. Code review is very open. We want to make it more open as possible. Um, this is open source project. Going to keep things open as possible. Make it egalitarian for everybody. So egalitarian, make it equal for everybody. Anybody could do anything. Anybody here could do a patch. There's only three or four steps to get a patch in. You have to sign the CLA. Um, we're a patch two project. We need to make sure that's the case. There's some legal issues around that. You sign the CLA. You push a patch up. If it's a good patch, we'll merge it. Um, automate everything. Turns out people don't like to do things, so you automate them. It makes it easier. Um, people don't like running unit tests or running integration tests, so we do that for them. Um, and this has been a really, this really helped us to, to increase the velocity and move ahead. Um, to make a patch, for example, you don't actually have to write, run the uni integration tests or the unit tests or the style tests. They may fail, and you could do them. You could look upstream on the uh, log server from Garrett and see what's failing and fix them then. But we do recommend running tests locally when possible, but you don't have to. Um, and be strict. It turns out in this project we have thousands and thousands and thousands, or hundreds and hundreds of developers but the number of actual reviewers is much smaller. So the limiting factor here is the reviewer. So to solve this, or to help solve this problem, we've been uh, strict as possible and try to reduce the burden on the developer, or on the reviewer. So developers, we have lots of them, and we love developers, and we want more of them. We also want more reviewers, and to make sure that the, the burden, we want to push the burden from the um, reviewer to the developer when possible. So that's an example that is style checking. That's not something a human should ever have to do. Looking at white space is tedious, and nobody likes to do it. We all like everything to look perfect, so we have a computer to do that for us. Um, same thing for we don't want integration tests to fail, so we have the computer run them and make sure that they never break. So we have a bunch of different tools for this. Um, this, this whole workflow, we have a lot of different tools, and there's been some other talks here about more details on how the tools work underneath. We have some basic tools, though. We have workflow testing tools, integration testing tools, and most importantly, communication. So workflow. We try to keep the workflow as, as streamlined as possible. So use Garrett for code review. It's a great tool if you guys ever haven't ever used it. Take a look. 
if you're looking for an internal code review tool, I really highly recommend it. We have this little uh, tool here called Git Review. The problem with Garrett is, is you have to cut and paste a strange URL to push things upstream onto Garrett. So we have this simple tool you type in Git Review, and it pushes it up, and it gives the URL on the review server for you. So it makes it nice and easy. You work on a patch, patch looks good, Git Commit, Git Review. So you don't have Git Push, you have Git Review, um, and that's a big change for the Garrett workflow. Um, and you want to fix your patch, you just amend it and do a Git Review again. And we have Jenkins behind the scene. Um, we're actually getting rid of Jenkins. Um, it turns out Jenkins doesn't scale to the, what we need. We have three Jenkins servers today, and we're looking to get rid of them all together, um, but that's a separate talk. Um, but Jenkins runs our tests for us. We have automated testing from Jenkins, a streamlined workflow from Git Review, and Garrett for the code review process. So testing. Testing is really important to us, as you hopefully figured out by now. Um, so this is for the integration and style checking tests. We need a Python tool called Tox. Tox is a great tool that runs virtual environments for us. So we have all these dependencies. We don't actually want to have everybody install them on the computer every time. Um, I don't usually want to do that myself. So you can run Tox. It'll install the dependencies locally, run a Python 2.6 version of the unit tests, rerun it on 2.7, rerun it on Python 3.3 if you want, rerun it on PyPy. So you can actually have one tool to run. Um, make sure you support different versions of Python. Test repository. Test repository is a great tool written by Robert Collins. Um, who's also working at OpenStack now. And one of the problems we have with so many tests is they're slow. So unit tests should be parallel, in theory. They're not usually if you don't write them correctly like we don't. Um, so the first step is we fix them up, made them parallel, and then I, now we use test repository to run parallel unit testing and parallel integration testing. So this dropped our um, test times down. Nowadays we run everything. So this is running 10 tests or so, all in parallel. And it takes under an hour to do this. This is thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of tests run very fast on all VMs, um, running, I think, four threads each, if I'm not mistaken. So switching from single threaded to parallel testing has really helped us. Um, it's a swap in if you use Python, swap in for a nose runner. Um, and it works great. Um, it also has some other nice features on it. It turns out a future work on that is it could actually run the unit tests on multiple machines which would be even great if you have a bunch of cloud servers. You could actually run, you know, use five cloud servers to run the tests on five different machines and go even faster. Um, and we're hopefully going to do that in the near future. And we have a whole bunch of automated code quality checks. So we use something called Flakegate, PEP8, PyFlakes, and Hacking. It all runs under one umbrella um, project, which is called Flakegate. So you just type in Flakegate on your, on your machine, and it all runs. So going into that, um, as I said before, style guides, everybody hates them. Everybody loves them. Uh, we feel the same about it. We hate it and we love it. Not everybody agrees on what everything should look like, so we try to pick a consensus that most people like, and we go with that. And the main reason, once again, is so there's less nitpicking about uh, style in the review. You missed a space here. There's too many spaces there. I don't like how you did this thing. We try to solve that by enforcing it automatically. Um, and it doesn't matter what your style guide is. The important part is that it all looks the same and everything looks the same. Um, a good example of this is you want to you know, you're looking at a new piece of code, you want it to look the like the rest of the code because you don't want to deal with different things. It all looks the same. It makes it a little easier to understand. Um, here's a short list of some of the checks we have. So from PEP8, um, PEP8 is the big um, Python standard for style. Turns out it's great and we like it a lot, but it's not enough for us. So we have a bunch more on top of it. Um, from PEP8, we get indentation, white space, line length. We use the 80-character limit because people are old school. I assume many of you are also. You have the 80-character terminals, and anything bigger you get really upset about, exactly. Um, so we've, we do 80 characters for everything. That can get a bit annoying on Python because you have the four-space um, indentation, so you can get a lot of weird code in there. But overall, we like it a lot. Um, white space, we just want it to look the same. We don't really care what it is, so we just pick PEP8. It's nice and easy. It's a standard. You can't really argue with that standard too much. Um, so that's a short list of the, some of the PEP8 um, checks we have. We also use Flake8, which is, looks for bugs in Python and does a great job of it, too. Um, some examples are unused imports. So you have an import. You change your code. You're not using it anymore. You refactored it, made it cleaner. You have this leftover import. You don't really need it. It doesn't look good. It can actually slow your code down in some cases. Um, so this tells you if you're using it or not and you get rid of it. So now we can actually say we have no unused imports in any of our code anywhere, which is a great thing. Um, undefined variable names. We've all done this. You make some code, you mess something up, you delete a line, 
you don't assign it before you use it. This will tell you, so this is a great tool for us. So this, this is an example of some of that static time analysis that we have. Um, it's not nearly as good as a compiled language, but it's not bad. Um, we have some stranger ones now. Now we're getting to our own tests. We decided that we actually want to have Apache 2 licenses and everything. Every file has an Apache 2 header. This is for the standard reason why many projects do it. We wanted to make sure if you look at that one file, you know it's Apache 2. Um, turns out people don't copy the Apache 2 header correctly every time. I don't do it every time correctly. So now we have an automated test to make sure of that. So we have two tests, H102 and H103, to make sure that the Apache 2 header is there and then it spells correctly and there's no typos in it. Um, we have a whole bunch of import rules. We have six or seven now. Um, and the short of that is we want it all to look the same, and we also want to make sure there's no merge problems. How many of those tests can be run by developers on the Sorry, could you repeat that? How many of those tests can be run by the, by the devs on their own machine? All of them. So this is all done automatically. On, you run this in your own machine. Um, you could actually use, so this is all under a tool called Flakegate, which has plugins for Emacs and Vim and things like that. So when I'm developing, for example, I actually run them in my editor. Um, and that's the nice thing is that this is all on, all the tests you run on gating can be run by the developer, and especially the unit tests and the style guide tests. So there's no, I write the test, I write the code, I run all the tests I can run, and I push it upstream and then it fails, because that just makes you furious. Good question. Um, so we have some import uh, rules. A big one is you want to make sure there's no merge conflicts with imports. So we have alphabetical imports. We break them down into third party, um, standard and project uh, imports to make things look a little cleaner and a whole bunch of other rules. We have one import per line, um, alph alphabetical imports, and both of those are for, if you have two people working in code, they both import the same thing. You don't want to merge conflict. If they're all in alph alphabetical order, you're not going to have a merge conflict. Um, this actually worked really great for us. We haven't had any merge conflicts in a very long time. And the nice thing here is you don't have to know the alphabet for this. The computer tells you what ABC is. Um, when I'm looking at a, you know, reviewing a piece of code, I can't tell if something's in alphabetical order. Um, this is one of the reasons why we've actually started this project is because manually reviewing A, B, C, you know, it's not fun. You don't want to do it. You want everything to look the same. You want to enforce this, but you don't want to do it yourself. Um, and so moving all this enforcement to the computer has really freed up a lot of reviewer time. Um, we have some doctoring rules. This is just one example. We don't doctoring to start with a space. This is sort of silly, but it, once again, it's all look the same. If you ever looked at a piece of code that has a whole bunch of different doc string formats or any documentation formats, you get a little confused and sort of furious at why things are all formatted differently. So we picked one style that we want to enforce, and we're automatically enforcing it. So that covers the, the unit tests and, the, and um, the style guide tests, which are quite extensive. I think in Nova, which is the big, it's the compute project in OpenStack, we have several thousand unit tests. I don't remember the exact number now, but it's massive and it's growing every day. Um, and then we have a whole bunch more integration tests on top of that. We have about, I think, 16, between 1 and 2,000 um, integration tests, and that's growing every day by leaps and bounds. We have a great team working on integration tests. We have a whole project for integration tests, and they do a great job of writing them. So the integration tests we had two years ago are not nearly as good as we have today. Um, we have a bunch of tools to actually support integration testing. As I mentioned before, we have this simple environment called DevStack for testing. So the first way you want to get in, if you want to actually work on OpenStack, the first thing you do is you set up DevStack in a VM somewhere. It's easy to use relatively, um, and this is also how we test things, so it's a nice environment to use that on. Um, we use a tool called Zool for integration testing and other testing. So we have this, all these tests take about half an hour or so. At one point before we went parallel, they took about an hour each. Um, and we want to merge everything serially, and because you want to gate on it, we don't want to have any merge conflicts. We don't want to have the case of the patch before you break something and then your patch gets merged because you ran them separately. So we have to test everything in order of the, the queue. Um, the problem with that is that if you run it in the, the, the trivial case, is that you can only merge, if it's an hour long test, you can only merge 24 patches in a day. And we run all the tests together because it's an integration test. So um, a compute change will affect a keystone or a, a, a identity change or a volume change or a storage change. So you're gonna run all these, all these projects are working together um, and we rarely, during a, a very busy time, we'll actually merge well more than 24 patches in a, a day. So we have this uh, tool that optimistically pipelines things uh, called Zool and does many other great things that I'm not going to go into. Um, but that allows us to actually merge as many patches as we want. Um, I think in the last release, testing cost us, it was our servers were donated by HP. That's not a plug for HP. We're just grateful that they did that. Um, this is all running an HP public cloud and Rackspace public cloud. And they're both 
donate about roughly the same amount of hardware, and integration testing costs about $100,000 in testing alone. Um, and which is, when you tell people that, some people are impressed and most people are going, that's not so much, we could do better. And we're trying to use more money. Um, so with, we add more tests and with all this uh, pipelining and everything, we actually run hundreds and hundreds of tests a day. And we plan on hopefully running hundreds more. Um, so with integration testing, when you started out, it was all sort of black and white, it all sort of worked. But now we have these transient failures, this big, complicated, moving puzzle. And you get transient failures. Something underneath is failing. It only fails 2% of the time. It's a race condition or it's something else. Um, and you have to have a way of dealing with that. So you have this tool called ReCheck. So if you get a, a your review, Garrett said, or, said, or Jenkins says, hey, your patch failed, and you don't think it was you, you look at the bug failure or something else, you say, hey, ReCheck, you list the bug you think it is, tape that in, and it'll actually rerun the test for you. This is true for merging. If your merge fails and you look at the failure and it's not related to your patch, you don't think it's you, you look up, you find a bug, and you say, recheck that bug. Um, turns out this wasn't enough, and humans are really bad at diagnosing things when it's not their problem. So we have another tool which we recently wrote called Elastic Recheck. As far as the change rate is concerned, um, out of curiosity, have you uh, compared these numbers to what the Linux kernel is doing? I have. They're bigger. Um, they're Linux kernel is much bigger than us. That's a great question. Um, they're also how many years old now? Nobody knows here? 20, 20 years old. Thank you. Um, we're three years old, so we're, we're still working on it. Um, a big difference is we're at, we have an egalitarian model, which means we try to keep as flat as possible. We don't have lieutenants or anything like that. Um, all you need is you need two core reviewers to review your patch, and core reviewers are generally interchangeable for the most part. So if I'm reviewing a patch and somebody else is reviewing a patch, that's the same as two other people reviewing a patch. Um, and so we have a very flat model, and that's one thing that makes us very unusual. That and we also are trying to do continuous deployments. You want to make sure trunk is always green. So those two things make us a very unusual model. Um, so you don't have this case where somebody's building this patch. You don't have a lieutenant working on um, next generation networking for a specific subset of a component. So. Um, that's the, this, this goes under the, the top 2% of all open source projects, not top 1%, I guess. Um, so we have a problem, which is this, the failures. Um, humans are really bad at, you see a bug, you're going to want to, we have actually another command to recheck bug X. We have recheck no bug. That's where something fails and you know it's not a bug. A glitch in the system, something infrastructure broke for a minute. Um, whatever it was, you want to say recheck no bug. Maybe it was running, the, the patch is an old patch and you think something is, is broken underneath it, you want to make sure that it still works on trunk. Recheck no bug is what you want. So people run that generally when they're not supposed to, and we wanted to fix that without making people spend hours debugging things. Um, so it turns out the infrastructure team, where there's some of them here to, uh, this week, they have this, all our logs go to Logstash, or Logstash, Kibana, Elasticsearch, that whole suite. So we have, you generate every test, every Tempest test, which is our Tempest is our integration test, generates tens of megabytes of logs, 10, 20 megabytes of logs, um, and that's growing all the time. Um, we run everything in debug mode because it's we're debugging things. So we have lots and lots and lots of logs. You don't want to read those all by hand. I've tried. It's slow. You're on like a slow connection on your internet. You get, it takes forever. Um, so we move everything to Logstash, and now we can use Logstash and Elasticsearch to actually do queries. So now that our integration tests are actually failing, by, we measure them by percentage of failure. So you have a 1% failure right now, I think, on average. Um, at one point during our, we had a feature freeze recently, and we had a release Havana, which is our latest release. Um, things got terrible. Our failure is about 10%, and nothing could get merged. You had, if you have 20 things in the queue, something was going to fail, and you'd have to recheck all the time, and it was a nightmare. Um, so this is one of the tools that helped us really get things down to about 1% where it is today. I don't know the exact numbers, but it's very low, and we're always working on making it lower. Um, and you want to keep it as low as possible. We're never going to get it down to zero because it's a big, complicated system with hundreds or th tens and tens of actual individual services running, talking to each other. Um, so it's hard to debug this by hand. So what we do is we actually we, we find the bug. We find it once. We actually go through the logs once. We find a something that identifies that bug. Um, the example is we had a, one of the services returning a 503 error. This is a service using a lot of underneath everything else, and that was making all kinds of things fail. So we look for the logs, in this case, for that 503 error from the log saying blah, 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 503, returned 503. Um, and now we actually write an uh, Elasticsearch query for this. And now every time something fails in the future, we run that Elasticsearch query on the logs from that uh, test. 
So this means that you have to only classify, manually classify failures once, and everything else, once, you've already man once you identify a loss Elasticsearch query for that failure, you could automatically classify it in the future. And this means you get this really nice results here, as you can see on the bottom, which is a list of how often we've seen this bug in the past um, two weeks, I believe. Um, we actually only have two weeks of logs in Elasticsearch because we have several terabytes of logs already, and we decided we don't actually need, that's not a priority for us now, is to make sure we have logs from forever. Um, so you can see here, this has been a pretty common bug, although I don't actually list all the bugs here, but you can see this is out of, out of, out of context here. It looks like it's happening a decent amount, and it turns out it is. Um, this is one of the bugs we actually need to go through and figure out what's actually the root causes and fix it. So this has really helped us actually identify how frequent bugs are. Um, this helped us notice that we didn't actually have one or two um, bugs causing transient failures. We had a whole bunch of them, and they're all separate, and we have to debug them all. We had one recently with a problem in a bug in HTTP, HTTP lib2, I think, that was causing everything to fail in all kinds of nasty ways. And without something like this, we'd have never known that that was, A, the bug they were looking for and how frequent it was. We'd all have thought it was 10 different bugs. Because you look at the, the tests and you see, oh, test X failed. And generally, that's what you're going to say is, test X failed, that's a, a, a failure in, in the, that test. And it turns out that's rarely the case anymore. Generally, the failure is much deeper in the stack with something causing any test to fail at any given time. So this has really helped us be lazy, like we want to be, and automate things. Yeah? yeah so, so you don't use uh, like, uh, sonar or you know, those types of uh, you know, code quality reporting? I'm not familiar with sonar, actually. No? OK. What is it? Well, it, it's, it's a way to view the, uh, you know, the, the test result, the static analysis result, uh, you know, code coverage, all those types of things. I mean, it's used in a few uh, open source foundations. But I was just curious to know which I guess it's all custom made here? Or is it um, it's mostly it. So you're using Jenkins for to run everything, and we have, there's a coverage tool in Python called Coverage, I think, simply enough. Um, so we use that for coverage. We have about 80 to 90% unit test coverage today, which is pretty good at best. <laughs> um, when you have a big project, generally want, we want like 110% coverage at least. So we're never really happy with it, but it's, it's not bad. And we're, we're pretty happy with how far we've come. Um, and you said earlier that you're moving away from Jenkins. Yes. Okay. Where are you going? Homebrew. So uh, the, we've, as I mentioned in the beginning, we're sort of at a scale that most things haven't been done at. Turns out Jenkins wasn't designed for gating. Um, it doesn't handle the load we have. So you run, I think we have several hundred Jenkins slaves at any given time. Um, and it turns out there's a bunch of complexities in the system that make it the Jenkins. It isn't really the great tool for us now. And we're moving away from it. One thing is the pipelining. It doesn't support pipelining. Um, so we have that, that's the, have the tool Zool to do that, and we don't use Jenkins for logs anymore because you don't have to, I don't know if you ever use Jenkins for looking at logs. They have like the console output, which is pretty good, but we have 20, 30, 40 logs that we collect now, and that's, we collect this all in a, just a Apache 2 server somewhere and Logstash. Um, so over time, we've actually grown our own system out um, in every way, and I think we're, I think there's, I think we're in step 19 of 20 to remove Jenkins. Jenkins is a great tool, and I'm not saying don't use it, for the record. It just turns out at this scale, when you have hundreds of tests a day and thousands of patches and developers, it doesn't scale well for us. Um, so this has been a really great tool for us, um, and we've been really, I'm proud of this in particular because I helped work on this. Um, and this has really helped us identify what's going on, make it easier for the reviewer. Before you'd see something failed, and you don't want to actually spend the time looking at the 20, 30 logs we have and find out exactly what it is, you want to just have the computer tell you what it is, and that could do that for us. The other thing this does for us is it says whenever a new failure happens. So we have a, um, an IRC bot, like everything else, we use IRC. We have an IRC bot for the saying whenever a failure happens that we've classified and every unclassified failure. So you can see as a developer working on this, you can say, oh, I think I saw a new bug today. Let's take a look at what it was. And sometimes it's actually a valid failure of the test, which are great. We like to see those because that means our system is working. Sometimes it's a new bug that we haven't actually um, analyzed before, and we analyze it, we add a query into the, the um, query list, and then we can actually check in the future. So communication is important for an open source project. We're in every time zone I could think of. Um, we use Launchpad for bug tracking. It's a great tool for us. This is actually another example we're going homebrew on this too. Um, we like Launchpad for bug tracking. We think it's really great. Um, but our Terry, our, our, our fearless uh, release manager, has some problems with it and the way we use it, or the way it's designed, and it doesn't really completely suit our needs. And at the scale we're at, we can actually afford to think about 
doing our own. Uh, but we've been really happy with Launchpad to date, though. Um, we use Etherpad for sharing things. Hopefully, everybody here has used Etherpad before. It's great. Um, Pastebin for pasting files back and forth. You have a bug failure, you want to share it with somebody. Pastebin's a great tool for that. Um, IRC, that's where we all hang out any given time of day. We're all on Freenode in OpenStack Dev, and there's a few other subrooms on there. Um, we have a wiki with all the rooms. Um, this is great because there's some people in Europe, Australia, China, all over, East Coast, West Coast. Um, for example, my team, my boss is in New York sometimes. He lives there, at least. Um, he's in Chicago right now, I think, or flying to Chicago. He was here yesterday. Um, so we're all over the world. I have the tech lead of my team is in New Zealand. Um, and so we're, it's hard to keep track of things in other, any other way. IRC is a great tool for that. Um, we have a mailing list also. Mailing lists could be a little slow for simple, you know, quick chat about something. So we have IRC for that. And the mailing list is for the big conversations. And we also do the, the code review on Garrett also. And that's another big tool. So we try to make sure all, that this is about keeping everything visible and in the open. And we try to keep everything in the open whenever possible. We have, um, we log all our IRC uh, conversations. We have all our meetings on there. So there's a meeting, two meeting rooms now. And there's some meetings today, actually, big meetings today. I think I'm going to skip them because I won't be available. Um, but we have all our meetings on IRC meetings. Anybody could join in and anybody could lurk, anybody could watch them. We have logs from all of them. It makes it really great for us to see what's going on in this ecosystem. Cry. Um, it hasn't happened yet. So, so far, so good. That's correct. Launchpad is canonical, and IRC is free node. We've had a few split brain cases in IRC, and generally you figure out the split brain and you wait a few minutes and it fixes itself. Um, Launchpad, I don't think we've ever had any failures with. I, I'm probably wrong on that, um, but it's been really great. We actually don't use, we don't use GitHub anymore because GitHub turns out doesn't, we don't want to continuously be pulling from GitHub, and we've had problems in the past with GitHub being attacked or this or that. So we actually have our own copy of most servers. We have our own PyPy uh, servers. We have a big problem with dependencies. Turns out you have you know, 16 different repos and 20, 30 services running. Keeping all the dependencies in line is very hard to do. Um, so we have our own PyPy mirror to help facilitate that. Um, we have our own almost every other server, but we don't have our own bug server or IRC because those have worked for us. Um, GitHub will rate limit you if you try to pull too many times. I don't know if you guys ever hit that before. It's a great tool. I love GitHub, um, but it rate limits you, so it's not really great for this. And then. If GitHub goes down, we don't want to stop everything. So we have our own um, Git servers as well. And we're always looking for more tools to make things easier for ourselves. Um, humans are the most critical resource in the project, whether it's developers or reviewers. And we don't like to use them whenever possible. So we like to automate everything possible. Um, we do this for infrastructure. We do this for the project. We do it in reviewing. So if anybody has any ideas for some great tools out there that we think we're missing, I would love to hear them, and maybe we could use them. Um, and lastly, there's one other way we actually make things easier for ourselves. So the other way we make things scale in development um, is split things down. So when OpenStack started, it had two projects, Nova and Swift. Nova was compute, Swift was object storage. So you could think Amazon EC2 and Amazon S3 here. Um, and nowadays, those two projects, Swift is still Swift. It's still storage. But it turns out creating, image, or creating uh, compute resources is complicated. There's a lot of moving parts. You have volumes. You have networking. Um, you have identity management, you have image management, and so now we have six projects for those two. So Nova is still compute, Swift is still Swift, Glance is images, Keystone is identity, Cinder is volume, and Neutron is networking. So the other way we broke is, is break things down. We have dedicated teams working on each one. We have uh, contractual REST APIs between them. Turns out those APIs are really great for us, but also means that we change them very slowly because they're concrete. Um, so we're currently working on the V3 API for Nova. We're over a year in the project. It's a very minor change, and we probably have about another six months to go because we're so slow at making these changes. Because we need support backwards compatibility, um, and we want to make sure nothing breaks. Um, and thank you. Any questions? <coughs> yep. Excellent question. We're working on that. Um, we have a, that's actually one of the problems we have today. We're trying to better track it is when you have hundreds of developers and you know, submitting patches every day. I think in Nova right now, last I checked, there's about 200, 200 to 300 outstanding patches. Um, the Nova core team is about 
19 to 20 people. So that's 19, 20 people can actually approve patches to be merged. The number of people mer actually doing actively reviewing any a large number of patches a day, over one a day, let's say, is fairly small. Um, maybe 30, 40 people doing that. So we're still limited by reviewers. And so we're trying to actually, we can't unfortunately say every patch has to be reviewed in, in a day because you don't have enough reviewers to do that yet. We're trying to better facilitate that, that process and make it happen um, better. We're also looking for more reviewers all the time. It turns out if you're a full-time reviewer, you get stir crazy and you get, you sort of go berserk looking at code all day and not writing anything. So you really can't tell reviewers like myself to know coding for you and keep reviewing. So, and that's been actually a, great, a big problem for us is we have, there's been patches out for several days, several weeks, several months, unfortunately. Um, as a project grows, this is one of our big challenges we're trying to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, do you organize your uh, developers in some sub teams which work closely together? Yes. Uh, do you use some methodology for that? Um, yeah, so we have, we have several rooms. We have the main development room. We actually have a non-development room. So somebody asks for, hey, how do I set up this config file or something? We generally say this is not a development problem. Go to, go to ask, you know, ask somewhere else so we could focus on development. Um, we have a general development room. Some teams work in there. There are separate rooms for all of these projects, except for Keystone, which I think uses the main room. So we have a separate room for Nova, so that's a sub-team there. Um, Swift has its own team, uh, own room. Glance has its own room. Cinder has its own room, and so does Neutron. Okay, but uh, when, we, when you start uh, working on some bigger picture in the usual uh, corporation or uh, company, it usually involves um, dividing this picture into smaller ones and some form of workflow to work on it from the beginning to, to the coding, to the review, to the down uh, or back to the coding. And uh, the way you speak about it, it's like, it just, um, like everyone was uh, just taking some part of it and doing what he or she wants. Yeah, that's about, so the answer to the question is, is yes, we have a way to do that, which is there is no formal way, but we have, nope. you, could, you could talk to your, you know, if you're working, let's say, the database in, in uh, Cinder, or the database in Neutron or something, you may have a, you know, you may talk in the Neutron room, you may have your own room, you want to talk quieter because it's too loud in there. Um, you may use the mailing list, you may use some code reviews. Um, you can use whatever tool you want. Um, but overall, as a project, we're actually a time-based release, just like a whole bunch of other projects because no big, you know, there's no, the organi the, there's a PTL, which is a team leader, a project team leader for every project here. And they can't tell anybody to do anything. They could ask them to, but they cannot tell them to unless they work for that company. So we have the problem of, we can't actually say this next release, we're going to have X, Y, and Z. Because if nobody does it, then nobody does it, and you can't stop them. Um, so it's like herding cats. So it's a, it's a big open source project. They're all different companies. Um, I work in, I rarely work with somebody in my own company these days. Um, we have a fairly big team at HP, so I work with them. Um, but overall, it's I work with people all different companies, and they can't tell me what to do. They ask me, and we talk, and we work it out. Um, but there's no do this now kind of thing. Right? Yep. Yeah, we do. Um, there's two ways we handle that. Um, one way is we have the, the transient failures, which we, you just recheck, and hopefully somebody will come along and actually fix that. The other one is if it's actually, a good example is we have this um, the integration testing. So that's generally black box. They take the APIs, the right tests for them. They don't really care what things look like underneath. Every so often, often, they find bugs in the actual code, and they'll say, we have this test. We want to merge it in it's not going to work because of this bug in the project. So you say, skip this test because of that bug. And then that when it's fixed, we have a bot that'll make sure everything is, uh, we'll say, hey, delete this. This is fixed. Yep. Can you explain what we're doing in terms of um, extending these processes to um, projects not form formally part of OpenStack, but being third party contributions or community contributions how we're using those tools yeah. for, those, for stuff like Diff Stack and StackForge. And That's a great question. So we have this, I think you gave it away in your, answer, your question. We have this tool called StackForge, um, which is we have many projects trying to work on becoming OpenStack projects or they're related to it. Um, for example, some chef cookbooks to deploy OpenStack. It's all targeted for the same community, so we want to use the same tools. So we have this separate um, domains. So we have several domains in OpenStack. We have OpenStack, OpenStack Dev, OpenStack Infra, and lastly, we have StackForge. StackForge is... Um, our, our 
just open to anybody tool. Anybody could put a project on there. So far, it's been, I think, almost all Python. I think we have some Perl in there, or not Perl. We have, I think, one other language in there today. Um, but we have a tool that can use all these tools we have today. You can use it in your system. Um, and our, t our infrastructure team will support you. And the idea is to make your project look like OpenStack if it's for the OpenStack community. And a follow-up question on that. What can we do to improve those? Because one thing that I just happened to run into was I think DevStack has just been broken for two weeks on RHEL, but only on RHEL. So the answer is we need to do a better job. So DevStack actually is an, is an official OpenStack project now. That's a whole separate yeah. can of worms. Um, more gating. We need more gating. Um, we have that 10, 12 tests. That's not nearly enough. We should have infinity, I think, mm -hmm. ideally. So um, I'm assuming blindly that we have infinite cloud resources. I know that is not true whatsoever, but that's not important for my it's not my concern, so to speak. So um, if you know, we have big companies behind us, if we need more resources, we could find them. So we're always looking for more tests we can run, like running um, DevStack on a RHEL, for example. In the back? Yeah, that gets hairy. We have a separate, so we actually, to get a new dependency in, we have a separate requirements repo. This is new as of this summer because of exactly what you said. Um, so you have a, working on a project, you want to add this new dependency on this new awesome library, this new version. You actually have to go talk to the, to go to the, there's a separate repo for requirements, make the change there. That's actually what we run our integration tests against. So actually they'll, we'll try the, we actually check out the versions, um, in the requirements repo when you're doing testing, make sure they all work, and then you can go to your project. So the idea is that we're getting better at making sure all projects have the same requirements versions. We also have a, a bot now that automatically pushes patches out. So if there's a dependency change upstream requirements, it'll push it out to all the projects. So that means we have a bot pushing patches, a bot reviewing patches, and a bot merging patches, and a bot detecting failures on the tests. So the only thing we haven't automated is the rest of the, per the, rest of the commits and the reviews. And we're working on that too. And how do you handle the code checking on this external code? Because they might not follow your coding standard. We use, um, we don't care about that, is the short answer. Um, we just pull down third party, you know, import whatever, pip install in our case. Um, it could be whatever, we don't care about third party libraries requirements. We're, we're using them as a third party ourselves, so we just import them and that's it. Um, we've had problems in the past with unsupported libraries are, are slowly being removed and have less support and that's been a problem for us. Um, but overall, we, if there's a bug upstream in a third party library, we've had problems and we've pushed patches in Eventlet, a whole bunch of others in PIP, Tox, um, and a whole bunch of other projects I can't think of right now. Um, but we're just a, another consumer in the Python ecosystem. Great, thank you.